So you know that you've decided you want to pursue a Cisco certification. I'm assuming you're starting at with the CCNA and then maybe you're going to go all the way up to the CCIE at some point in time or, or maybe stop midway at the CCNP or something. So you're pretty familiar with the fact that there's going to be a lot of studying involved. You're going to have to crack open a lot of books, read a lot of web pages, create a lot of flashcards and memorize, memorize, memorize stuff. So in addition to all of that, which you can comfortably do behind your computer or sitting at a coffee shop with a book in front of you, what is this thing of rack rentals and why would you use it? How can that add to your studying experience? And that's what I'd like to talk about here in this section. So what should a CCNA know? If you're claiming to have a CCNA certification, I'm assuming it's not just because you just want to pass a test, you know, I mean, I'm sure there are some people out there. I know there are people who are retired, really have no interest in, in working, and they just like passing certifications because they like to keep their minds sharp. They like to learn new things. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. But I'm assuming that does not describe the majority of you that are watching this video. Most of you who are watching this video want to pass this certification because you have a defined goal or objective in mind. It might be because you're not in the computer industry right now, or maybe you are, but you're not in the networking industry, and you'd like to move into the computer networking industry as like a network admin or a network engineer or something like that. Or maybe you are currently in the networking industry and you know that by getting these Cisco certifications, it will advance your career. It'll open up new opportunities at your current job for you to touch equipment and do designs that you couldn't previously do without that certification on your resume. So the main point here is that you are pursuing the certification so you can show it to someone and you can say, I am certified. And what that means to them is that you know some things and you can do some things. Somebody who passes a CCNA or a CCNP and then the very next day forgets it all, that certification is useless. It's not going to land them a job. And if it does, they won't be in that job for very long. So you actually want to get some skills out of this. So knowing some things, certainly, you know, the vast majority of all of these exams is memorization. You have to know protocols and theories. You have to know why would you use this particular feature? What problem was this feature designed to solve? So all of that is reading things and memorizing things. But in addition to that, someone who, said, who is looking at you saying, oh, so you're a CCNA, you're CCNP. They're assuming you can actually do things as well. You can install equipment. You can configure features and protocols. And you can troubleshoot various things. So in addition to being able to just study and read stuff from a book, they're expecting you to be able to actually walk into their company and start being productive. So the CCNA, in order to actually work on this equipment, you have to know how to work with their Cisco IOS command line. You have to know what the commands are to do what you want to do. And the CCNA, the way this tests your knowledge of that is primarily based on multiple choice questions, uh, which involve memorization, right? Being able to recall from memory what the command is to do something, to be able to identify in a list of commands what the appropriate command is, or which command is spelled correctly versus a bunch of them that are not spelled correctly. There are also some GUI-based questions like drag and drop things. And then when you take the CCNA and the CCNP, uh, that you're going to experience some simulations as well, where you actually have to get into what looks and feels like a real Cisco router or a Cisco switch and configure something, make something work, or maybe fix something that isn't working, or maybe identify why something's not working. So those simulations are the closest to actual real world applicable experience of getting into equipment and doing something on it. So ultimately, in order to be CCNA or CCNP certified, you have to have memorized hundreds of Cisco IOS commands. And this is why it takes months to get ready to pass these exams, because there's just a lot of memorization involved. You know, a lot of times, unfortunately, there are people that, that attend live instructor-led boot camps, right? They'll come to a hotel, or they'll come here to the IE office, and, and they'll sit down, and they'll have this ex expectation of, well, I want my CCNA, I want my CCNP, 
haven't really done any studying up until now, but I'm expecting that if I sit in your class and I sit in front of you for nine or 10 or 11 hours a day for five or seven days, at that point, I'll be ready to go get my certification. There is no way you can do that. All of these certifications require memorization, right? Even passing your driver's exam. You can sit in a class to teach you how to drive, but that's not gonna help you memorize what color of stoplight means go and what means stop, what particular sign means this or that. You have to memorize stuff. Same thing is true here of Cisco iOS commands. Just being exposed to the commands in a boot camp or a video is not gonna get them ingrained into your head to where you can use them when you need to use them. So ultimately, you need to know when it's appropriate to use a particular command at which Cisco iOS mode a particular command can be used. Now, in the real world, fortunately, when you're on a, a real piece of equipment in somebody's lab, you can use the question mark, right? If you don't exactly remember what commands are available or you know the command you need to use, but you don't remember what mode it's available at, you can use Cisco's iOS command line help, the question mark, to try to figure that out. But, once again, if you're going into a job, if you're gonna be working for someone, you don't wanna be spending a lot of time using the command line help to try to figure out your job. It's gonna be frustrating to you and it's gonna be frustrating to the person who hired you. You wanna go into that job already knowing a lot of commands, already knowing exactly how to use them. You also wanna know why they may or may not work and what dependencies they have. Just because you know a particular command, well, if that command in order to work requires that you configure three or four commands before it, and you don't know those things, well then knowing that command doesn't do you any good. And you need to know uh, what output is relevant when troubleshooting. There are hundreds of show commands, you know, commands that begin with show this and show that. And a lot of this output that you'll see when you're troubleshooting is irrelevant. You know, for most troubleshooting, a lot of the output is, well, there's a lot of stuff in here, but I'm really only looking for what's on line number five or I'm only really looking at this particular paragraph right here. That's the stuff that's relevant to me. Well, if you don't have the experience with Cisco IOS, you have no idea what that show command is showing you. you. You will spend a lot of time trying to understand everything that's there, when in a lot of cases, a lot of these show commands, a lot of the output's really only good for the developers of Cisco. It wasn't even really meant for troubleshooting of a normal network admin or engineer, but you wouldn't know that unless you had experience with the command and you knew when and how to use it. So, someone in the live audience is asking a very good question. They're saying since there's hundreds of commands, sometimes it feels like thousands of commands, but I, I wouldn't say thousands of commands, but there are definitely hundreds of commands. How do we know which commands we need to learn for the CCNA and the CCNP? Good question. And a similar question to this that's along the same lines is, okay, well, how do I know what features and protocols I need to learn for the CCNA and the CCNP? And how do I know what level of depth I need to get into for those features and protocols to pass the certification? And I always answer the same way for all of this stuff. I refer people back to two resources, Cisco's Blueprints, so on Cisco's website, actually you can just go to Google and type in CCNA routing and switching blueprint or CCNP route blueprint. And Cisco provides what they call a blueprint, which is basically a bulleted list of all the topics they want you to know for their certification exams. So that helps narrow the focus a little bit as far as what topics or features or protocols do I need to start studying to prepare for this exam. Now, as far as the actual commands are concerned for that, I typically refer people to the Cisco official certification guides. They have official certification guides and they have another set of books called the foundation learning guides. Typically speaking, what I tell people is if a topic is in that book, like let's say you've got the ICND2 certification guide, which is the second test of the CCNA. If there's a feature or protocol in that ICND2 book, it's a safe bet that that is a testable feature. You might see that feature or protocol on the exam. And if the feature or protocol is in the book, if the exam expects you to know how to configure it, how to make it work, how to troubleshoot it, they will put the, the commands in that book. So in the certification guide or in the foundation learning guides, 
It will describe the feature, then it'll show you the commands, it'll show you what output we, you would expect, and it will be in there. Now sometimes, like for example, at the CCNA level, sometimes the CCNA will introduce a topic with the expectation of, we don't at this level expect you to know how to turn this on, how to configure this feature, how to troubleshoot this feature. We just want to expose you to the idea that this feature exists and what it's meant to do. And so in that particular case, they won't give you the commands to do that particular thing. But if the CCNA or the CCNP expects you to know how to configure, how to troubleshoot, those books will have the commands to do it. Uh, there's also a question here on the, in the live audience, what makes for a better rack rental, uh, or basically, which is better, GNS3, Cisco's uh, viral, or rack rentals, whether it be INE's rack rentals or somebody else's rack rentals. So I think that if you're studying and preparing for layer three technologies, right? Everything at like the networking layer or above. So we're talking about routing protocols. We're talking about access lists. We're talking about quality of service. All of that stuff can be done very easily using viral or GNS3. Viral and GNS3 are both equally good as far as getting you prepared for that. Where they both fall short is at the layer one and the layer two stuff, especially layer two. For example, if you're preparing for the CCMP switch exam, or you want to learn switching stuff for the CCIE, there's unfortunately a lot of stuff you can't do in Cisco's viral and GNS3. Um, a lot of the security features, for example, private VLANs and DHCP snooping and port security are not available in those platforms. And that's where you really need real live hardware, real switches to do that. So for switching, you really need rack rentals to get really good at LAN switching topics. For routing and everything else, Viral and GNS3 works just fine. Okay, so now we know we need to become proficient with the Cisco IOS command line. It's not good enough just to know what the feature is, how it works, what its timers are, what it was designed to do. We need to know what commands do I actually type in to get this thing working. So how do you learn those commands? Well, one way is via rote memorization, right? And I definitely am going to recommend this. For example, flashcards. You know, because the CCNA and CCNP and even CCIE written exam are 80, 85% multiple choice questions, create flashcards for yourself that are like that, right? So for example, you might create a flashcard on a little three by five card on, you ask yourself, what is the command to configure a new VLAN, VLAN 7, and at what mode would I configure that? And maybe on the back of the card, you can type, you know, you can write in VLAN 7, then you can say global configuration mode. Or another way you could do it is you could type in, you could have a little flashcard say, and you actually write this in handwriting or something, which of the commands below is the appropriate command to configure a switch as a VTP server? And then maybe actually write down yourself you know, A, B, C, and D, and maybe put the correct answer as D, and then put some, make up some distractors for yourself for A, B, and C. And then once again, turn the card over and you've got the correct answer there. So rote memorization, right? Reading stuff, quizzing yourself on it, finding online quizzes and tests. There's tons of quizzes and tests available here at INE. We also have CCNA. We've got both an ICND-1 and an ICND-2 practice exam you can take online. We also have CCNP, route and switch practice exams, and there's lots of other practice exams out there as well. The Cisco certification guidebooks, at the beginning of pretty much every single chapter, they have a do I know this quiz that's usually anywhere from like 15 to 20 questions that you can take. So that's all examples of how to memorize the commands. But then you're also going to need hands-on practice, uh, which now involves using labs and simulations. And this is where INE's rack rentals can really become useful. Here's an example. Here's an analogy. Let's say that you were preparing for, you're learning a new language, and I'll just say it's, uh, it's Swahili, okay? So you're gonna be taking some exam uh, to test you on your knowledge of Swahili. Well, yeah, you could probably learn the words and the grammar and the syntax of the Swahili language by reading through a book and just memorizing it, reading through the book, writing stuff down. But 
how are you going to learn the language the best? Are you actually going to be able to speak it to other people if you've never spoken it before? If someone's speaking Swahili to you, are you going to be able to understand that if all you've done is by memorizing stuff in books? No, this is why you actually need to get hands-on practice, whether it be a foreign language, preparing to get your driver's license, you need to get behind a car and actually practice. Same thing with this. You're not going to be able to retain or sync in those iOS commands and really get them in your long-term memory unless you do them. You know, one, one common uh, thing that's known about learning, just learning in general, how human beings learn, is the more of your senses you get involved with learning something, the more apt you are to actually retain it. So when you're reading something, you're just involving your eyes, right? But when you're doing hands-on practice, now you're involving your fingers, your sense of touch, as well as your eyes. You're getting more of your senses involved. And so the more of your senses, and if you could somehow figure out a way to get your nose and your ears involved with learning iOS commands, that would be even better. But this is all to say, you know, you got to ask yourself, can I really become proficient learning the Cisco iOS command line just from books and stuff I can see, you know, online practice exams? Not really. To become proficient, to be able to walk into someone's network and configure it, troubleshoot it, monitor it, you need to have that experience before you walk in there actually getting on routers and switches and doing things. And so this is why you really need hands-on time on rack rentals. So now that we've got that out of the way, in the next remaining section of videos, I'd like to talk about using INE's rack rental system, how do you do it? How do you rent it? What are the bells and whistles? What are the buttons you're going to press? And that's what we're going to get into in the next set of videos.